that you're here. Hey, glad to have everybody in the room today. I want to welcome online church as well. We have people like Darlene all the way in Arkansas, Anna in Fayetteville, North Carolina. Uh, we've got people in Midlothian all around this area. Come on, give it up to online church. Also, everyone in our theater, in our simulcast room, welcome as well. Uh, we're glad you're here. My wife and I, Kelly, uh, and myself wanted to say thank you for coming. And if you're a guest today, thank you for being here. Um, we're so excited that you are here. Well, I hope you're enjoying this gospel series. Come on, you guys get into the gospel series. It's been powerful. And uh, I encourage you, even if you're new to us, what we're doing is we're just going through the Gospels. Um, you can join us online uh, on Facebook, on Instagram. We put, post it every week. Um, just a little reading every day. We're trying into 60 days, read through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And if you haven't started yet, it's never too late uh, to jump in and get started. Also encourage you to watch the series uh, called The Chosen. If you're going to binge something, binge Jesus. Come on, somebody. And so, uh, great show that's out there based on the Gospels of Jesus Christ. Well, uh, you guys are in for a treat today. We have a very special guest speaker today that's not really a guest to us. Uh, he's spoken uh, to our youth uh, on a couple times, and uh, I got to know Chris uh, uh, several years ago, um, and uh, he's from the great, my mom would say it like this, uh, because she's from the same state. He's from the great state of South Carolina. Come on, give it up for the South. And... Uh, and, and uh, Chris has got a powerful gift on his life. Uh, he is someone, and when I was kind of thinking about this series, I was like, man, who's somebody that I could have that is a living testimony of the gospel of Jesus Christ? This young man has not only uh, was going in one direction, and God completely saved him, changed him, set him free, turned his life around, and then called him into the ministry. And now he's a traveling evangelist. He home bases out of South Carolina. Um, and uh, he's preached, like I said, to our students, by the way, you service tonight. Come on, Verge. Lord, we're going to have a great time. He's going to be back tonight uh, speaking to our, our youth. You do not want to miss that. Um, and uh, But this is his first time ever speaking on a Sunday. Now, I talked him up big. I talked you up big time to him, and I said, there is not a better place in America to preach than this church right here. Hey, the nine o'clock lived up to it. They were full of energy, so all the pressure is on you, 11 o'clock. Would y'all show Chris Dew some honor as he comes and brings, come on, Chris, bring the word to us this morning. It's going to be good. Love you, bro. Thank you, bro. Thank you. What's up, church? How y'all doing? You good? Man. I told the nine o'clock, and I'll tell y'all, I don't think I'm ever leaving. I mean, there's places I go to preach, and it doesn't come like this, man. So it's fun to preach in this house, man. And how many of y'all know you're blessed? Your pastors are incredible pastors, and this church is an incredible church, man. Let's give it up for your pastors real quick. Can we honor them? Let's honor them. Come on, man. Well, it is a true honor to be here. Um, and like he said, uh, you know, I live in Anderson, South Carolina. It's about 20 minutes from Clemson, and I don't want to talk about it. Oh, man, but I have an awesome wife. I think we have a picture of her that's going to be on the screen. Yeah, this is Kathleen. Yeah, I'm blessed. I'm blessed. Um, and we have a little girl as well. I think we got a picture of Evelyn Joy right there. I don't even have to preach today. We'll just leave that thing up there. That is the glory of God who wants to get saved. Come on, somebody. Yeah, but we're... Honored uh, to be here uh, this morning, man. Would y'all pray with me real quick, and then we'll jump in uh, to God's word. Heavenly Father, this is about you. This church is about you. Everything's about you. The earth is about you, God. And we ask you right now, would you inhabit this room? Would you change our hearts, God? Oh, man, would you break chains? Oh, man, would you speak through me? I'm weak. You're strong. Have your way. Oh, man, I pray that you would save souls this morning. Change lives. Heal families. Heal people actually, physically. You are a miracle-working God, and we're grateful for that, God. Holy Spirit, have your way in this place this morning. All for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. How many 
people have ever felt trapped before? Has anybody ever felt trapped in their life in one way or another? I felt trapped on my honeymoon one time. (laughs) True story. Uh, We had a great wedding. It snowed on our wedding day. It was amazing. I'm way too blessed with my wife. Like, she's an incredible woman of God. Um, Then we went on our honeymoon, and it was awesome. Um, Flew to Punta Cana and just had a great time. Ate tons of food. It was amazing. Uh, But then we had to fly home, and we had to come through customs. And for most people, that's a non-issue, right? Like, you're in the line, um, and they ask you some questions, and then they stamp your passport, and then you go back into the country. You stand in line, they ask you some questions, they stamp your passport, and then you go back into the country. I mean, we're standing in line on that honeymoon high. You know what I'm talking about? With this vision of how life is going to be. Oh my gosh, that's so amazing. <laughs> uh, we got married, and I just love you. You love me. It's amazing. I can't wait to go back, and we're going to have a house and a dog, and it's going to be amazing on a white picket fence, and we're going to change the world. We're going to travel like whatever you want us to do, God. We're in for that, a life of joy, a life of freedom. Everything's amazing. And then we get up to the counter (laughs) on that honeymoon high, (laughs) you know, and they're like, "Um, hey, actually, do you mind hanging out in this little room? I was like, no, I'd rather go catch my flight. They're like, you're going to hang out in that little room. All right, I guess we're going in there. Had no idea what was going on. And then about an hour later, uh, the, the, uh, the officer comes up and says, excuse me, Mr. Dude, you know why I'm holding you? I was like, bro, have no idea. I got married eight days ago. I'm trying to start my life. Like, what are we doing? And he said, well, you have an active arrest warrant and I'm probably going to have to arrest you tonight. Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. I had to go back and tell my wife of eight days, her pastor husband is probably getting arrested. And I was like, babe, like, here's what's happening. She was like, listen, I'll call the lawyer. I'll get you out. I'll break you out if I have to. And I was like, I said, that's why I married you, girl. Come on. Oh, man. But they held us another hour, and I was like, man, I don't know what's going to happen. This could be really bad. And then about an hour later, he comes back. Except this time, he's got all of his friends with him, handcuffs, and a whole bunch of guns and stuff. I was like, what do you think I'm going to do? You think I'm going to run? Like, I'm like 180 pounds. I'm not going to. But anyways, he's like, I'm so sorry. I have to arrest you. And literally, in the middle of the airport, I got handcuffed and arrested. Had this big dream of what life was going to be like, how amazing life was going to be. Joy, freedom, amazing things. A white picket fence and a dog named Marley. Honeymoon high. This is amazing. And instead, I found myself enslaved. And if I'm honest with you this morning, think spiritually speaking, that a lot of us have had that experience. We have this vision of what life could be, a life of joy, a life of freedom, a life of following Jesus. It's amazing. This thing's going to be amazing. And instead, we are trapped. And we feel like I did that day in the middle of the airport, handcuffed, So here's our question that I'm going to try to answer this morning from God's word. It's this. How can we live in true freedom? Touch your neighbor real quick and say, how can we live in true freedom? Oh, that wasn't good enough. I need you to touch your other neighbor and say, how can you live in true freedom? All right, if you have a Bible, let's flip over to John chapter 8, and that's where I'm going to camp out this morning. Um, If you don't have a Bible, then it's going to be on our screen right here, and I'm going to start reading in verse 31. Here's what it says. And Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, 
Oh, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And they answered him. They said, well, we're offspring of Abraham, and we have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say that you will become free? And Jesus answered them, truly, truly. Anytime Jesus says, truly, truly, you should perk up and say, what you saying? (laughs) Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever, yet the son remains forever. And I love this verse. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I've got three points for us this morning trying to answer the question, how can we live in true freedom? Here's point number one. How can we live in true freedom? One is that we have to acknowledge we all need freedom. He explains this. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The context of this passage is that Jesus is healing and teaching. And he's traveling around and doing lots of crazy things. And this small group of people hear him teaching one day and they're like, I think we're going to believe in him. He's got some nice things to say. He's encouraging. This is cool. Let's follow him. And he says, all right, guys, here's, here's our first lesson of how to follow me. You need some freedom. He said, I want to talk about that thing in your life. And they say, whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah, maybe the Gentiles need freedom, but not the Jews, right? I don't know if you know who we are, but we're Jewish. We're descendants of Abraham. There is no reason we need to talk about freedom here this morning. And ultimately what he says in response to that is, yeah, we do. (laughs) Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone, that's a key word, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. Because here's the thing, guys, our culture views freedom as the lack of restrictions. This is what culture says. They say, man, a life for freedom is a life without restrictions. I can do whatever I want. Yet how Jesus describes true freedom is not the lack of restrictions, yet it's the unhindered experience of the presence of God. True freedom is not the lack of restrictions, yet it's the unhindered experience of the presence of God. Right? So, for example, alcohol. It's enjoyable, right? If you drink it, it's amazing, right? But yet, if you take away the restrictions around it, what happens is it eventually enslaves you. I'm going to step on some toes this morning if that's okay with you. How about cell phone use? I've got this thing on my phone where uh, that I can only use Instagram like a couple hours a day, right? It's like in the afternoon, it's after lunch, it's amazing. Um, and I have a passcode that my wife only knows the code to. It's awesome. All right, so I'm like, I want to get on Instagram. Nope, I can't get on Instagram. And it honestly helps me because I get a lot of work done normally because I'm not scrolling through Instagram over and over again. Yet there have been times where I've asked my wife, I was like, hey, I have to post for work. Please, will you give me the passcode real quick? And she's like, okay, here it is, you know, because she's a loving wife and, and all that. And then three hours later, I've commented on every one of y'all's posts and I'm, I'm scrolling, I'm talking to everyone, right? Because true freedom is not the lack of restrictions. That's how culture defines freedom, though. Drugs, alcohol, anxiety, depression, porn, unhealthy marriage, social media, phone addiction, overeating, overspending. I need someone to put some restrictions on my Amazon account, Pastor Brian. Every time there's a new box, it's a new book. Uh, My sweet wife says, "Um, have you, just a quick question, have you read the other 800 books you've ordered this month? And you don't even know about the online books, the audio books, right? 
True freedom is not that absence of restrictions. It's the unhindered experience of the presence of God. Jesus says, hey, it's not just some of us that need freedom this morning. Everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. Here's the reality of the universe. You and I were made oh, to have an intimate, close friendship with the God of the universe. You and I were made to know God and to know him intimately. And the scripture says that in his presence there is the fullness of joy and at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. You and I were created for that. The fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore. Everything we need, the peace we long for, the joy we long for, the pleasure we look for is found in an intimate relationship with the God of the universe. Yet, something has gone terribly wrong with that. And scripture says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And therefore, what happens is that all of us have looked at the all-satisfying God of the universe and said, no, thank you, and turned to the Amazon cart, (laughs) turned to the Instagram, turned to the bottle, turned to the pipe. Scripture says that in his presence is fullness of joy, yet we have all turned away, Heismaned him, and said no thank you. And therefore we are separated from the all-satisfying God of the universe and we're left empty with a hole in our soul. Yeah. But here's the thing about that emptiness that we've all experienced, is that that emptiness will not go untreated. Yeah. Everyone in the universe is treating that emptiness with one thing or another. All of us are trying to fill it with a whole bunch of audiobooks or the TV screen or pornography or alcohol or drugs or anything that we've already talked about and other things. And here's the thing that our scripture says. Everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin, right? It's not that instantly, right, that we're enslaved right off the bat. It's as we practice that. We have this hole in our soul, so we treat it with something, and then over time, it's like, oh, that kind of worked. And I'm going to keep using it, keep doing it, keep doing it. And eventually, it ensnares us, entraps us, and enslaves us. And then it's like quicksand, that the more we fight trying to get out of it, the more we sink Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is enslaved to sin. How can we experience true freedom? Well, one, we have to acknowledge that we need it. Here's the words of Jesus, right? This is how he opened up the Sermon on the Mount. He said this, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. How we enter into the kingdom isn't through thinking we're awesome, yet it's through acknowledging that we can't do it ourselves. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. He says the first step of how we live a life of freedom in the kingdom of God where there are no chains is we have to acknowledge we need freedom. How can we live in true freedom? One, we have to acknowledge that we all need it. Yet if we can't rescue ourselves out of the quicksand, how can we do it? What's the answer? Here's point number two. We got to come to Jesus. Come on. We've got to come to Jesus. Here's what he says in verse number 36. I love this verse. If the sun sets you free, what destination? Come on, somebody. If the sun sets you free, you will be free indeed. When Jesus started his ministry, he declared the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent and believe. He said, hey, hey, all that freedom that you're longing for is here. And then he quoted Isaiah 61. And it says this, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. And he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, freedom to the captives, sight to the blind, and freedom 
Oh, to those who are oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Translation, Jesus came to bring true freedom. The freedom that we long for is found in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And we see this all through the New Testament. Every encounter Jesus has with somebody and they're enslaved or bound up in some way with one encounter with Jesus, they're set free. I love the story of the uh, demoniac. Right? Have you heard this story, right? So this man, man, he's inhabited by lots of demons and culture had tried everything to set him free. They said, man, we're going to lock him up. We're going to put him in the mental hospital, this type of medication, that type of medication. And he still was outside of his mind. But one encounter with Jesus and the scripture says that his mind was restored, that he was literally delivered and he was in his right mind. And the whole town was scared of him after that. They're like, I don't know what just that's some Harry Potter stuff up in there. I don't know what that was. But Jesus came to set people free, right? The woman caught in adultery. All the religious people had found her in the act of adultery. And they had said, whoa, 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 whoa. The law says that you should be stoned. You should be ashamed. You're guilty of this. And then what they did is they brought her before Jesus. And with one interaction, this lady was set free from her shame and her sin and the quicksand that she found herself in. Or the woman at the well. This is one of my favorite stories in the whole Bible. Because this lady had had five husbands, and culturally back then that was awful. right? Everyone looked down on her and said, I can't believe this, this woman. I can't believe this. And she hung her head and was ashamed. And it was a hot day one day, so she came right in the middle of the day because she knew no one else was going to be at the well, and Jesus was waiting for her there. And he said, hey, 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 do you mind if you give me a drink? And she said, why would you ask me for a drink? You're a man, I'm a woman, and you're a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan. Why would you ask me? And he said, if you knew the person you were talking to, you'd ask me for water, and I would give you living water. Translation, this lady was a little thirsty, if you know what that means. She spent her whole life trying to fill that hole in her soul with many men, yet couldn't find something that actually filled the void. But one encounter with Jesus, he filled the hole in her soul with the thing it was made to be filled with, and that's the presence of God. All kinds of other stories we could go into, healings over and over again, where they had spent all their money, tried all the doctors. I've been to this person, that person, this person, and I'm still trapped. But one encounter with Jesus touched him. He said, be healed. And he healed him. And for the past 2,000 years of church history, we've continued to see that same power flow out from the people of God. And I want to tell you, if you're here and you're bound up with anything, the presence of God is here and he can set you free today. To go back to uh, the original story I started with and I cut short intentionally, I'm in the middle of the airport in handcuffs, all by myself, had this big plan of what life was going to be like, and instead, I'm enslaved. And I'm trying anything to get free, Pastor Brian. I'm telling him I read my Bible that morning. I was like, hey, listen, I'm super spiritual. I read my Bible. Can I get free? He said, no. I was like, um, well, I got married eight days ago. Can I go free? No. It's like, well, I'm like a pastor. You know what I mean? Like, I just got done preaching. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm good. Can I get free? No. I had tried everything to get free. And he's like, nah, like, we got to transport you down to the jail. He said, but I'll do you one. I mean, if you want to put the handcuffs behind your back and I'll put something over your back and you can hide them, uh, then it'll be fine. We can walk you through the airport and, and hardly anyone's going to know. Now, all these officers around me and look at me. 
I ain't one of them, right? So they would, everyone's definitely going to know why I'm getting strolled through. But I told them, "Uh uh-uh, I want the handcuffs in front. I want everyone to know I'm getting arrested in the middle of the airport. Maybe that's part of my fallen nature that I wanted them all to see that. But there was like only three people in the airport, so it didn't really matter at all. But I thought I was bad for a few minutes, you know? I said, look at me. Oh, man, I planned, man, if I'm going down, I'm going out like Paul. I'm going to preach the gospel in the prison. All the guards are going to get converted. The prison's going to shake. I'm going to go out the door. Come on. Um, But instead, (laughs) what happened is when I got there, uh, the officer at the jail came over to the arresting officer and started whispering some things in his ear. And I was like, what is happening? This is worse than I thought. I'm going to be in here till I die. Electric chair. Uh, But uh, the officer came over uh, and he said, hey, I'm sorry, Mr. Dew, but there's been a big mistake and I'm going to have to unarrest you. I said, well, I was kind of excited about preaching in the jail, but it's all right. I'm down with that. So he took off the handcuffs, and he took me back to my wife. Yet the reason why I got unarrested that day, I mean, was not because I was spiritual or because I tried really hard, because I tried to get my hand out of that thing. You know what I mean? I was like, I think I can run. This will be good. I tried everything. I said, I went, man, I've only been married eight days. I promise I won't do it again. Like, I don't know what you got me here for, but I pro- let, let, let me go. But none of that was able to get me free. Here's what he told me, though. He said a few years prior uh, that a judge heard your case. And he heard all the details of what you had done in your previous life and who you are now. And he slammed down the gavel and said, it's paid for. It's forgiven. I'm about to preach. If you're here and you are a believer in Jesus Christ, 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ hung on the cross, bloody and naked, and because of what he's done, you can go free. It wasn't because I tried really hard that day or because I read my Bible or because I acted real spiritual or because I had these practical. No, no, no. The reason I got unarrested that day was because a judge had made a decision. He had slammed down the gavel and said, I don't hold this against you anymore. And on his authority, I got unarrested that day. It works the same way spiritually. How we get free of what we're struggling with in life is not because we try really hard. It's because the king of the universe is a just judge and he has paid for your sins. If you're in Christ, he declares you holy and blameless without a spot or blemish. And therefore, just like that officer came to me and said, these handcuffs are unlawful for you. Ultimately, because of a a decree a judge made, if you're here and you're a believer in Jesus, anything you're trapped in right now is unlawful. And just like that officer looked at me and said, hey, Mr. Dew, you're free to leave. I want to speak on behalf of Almighty God this morning and tell you you're free to leave. And if you're not a believer in Jesus this morning, these are the words he wants you to hear. These are the words of Jesus. Come to me. All who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest for your souls. Man, take my yoke upon you and learn from me because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And you will find rest for your souls. How we live in true freedom isn't on our own effort. Oh man, the more we fight in the quicksand, the more we sink. Yet, as you prayed earlier, 
put your hands up in a posture of I surrender. And Jesus loves to come and grab those hands and pull you right out of that junk. Jesus Christ was a real person. He ain't Harry Potter or Lord of the Rings. He was a real historical person. He came to earth. He lived a perfect life in our place. He was crucified on a criminal's cross. He was put in the tomb. On the third day, Jesus Christ literally rose from the grave, conquering sin and death and shame and Satan and everything. He hung out for 40 days. He ascended into heaven. He left his Holy Spirit here, and he promises, I'm going to come back one day. And when Jesus comes back, all will be made right again. All the believers in Jesus are going to get to experience eternal life with him in a brand new creation, a new heaven and new earth. It's going to be good, y'all. It's going to have some good food. It's going to be some good people up in there. And we're going to get full intimacy with the God of the universe. In his presence is fullness of joy and at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. How can we live in true freedom? One is that we have to acknowledge that we can't do it on our own. We need some help. Two is we got to come to Jesus, cry out to him, hands raised in the quicksand. I've tried my best to get myself out. I can't do it. Pull me out, daddy. And he loves to. And then here's point number three. Keep abiding in Jesus. Keep abiding in Jesus. Here's what the word says. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will what? Set you free. free. Translation, freedom is not a one-time event. It's an ongoing process. How many people know that this morning, that freedom ain't just a one-time event, but it's an ongoing process? True disciples of Jesus aren't those who respond to an invitation and then live lives apart from Christ. True disciples abide in Jesus. When I first started traveling, I was real broke, like broke, broke. Um, I had a friend that traveled with me, um, and he was also broke, broke. I mean, we would travel places and we didn't fly anywhere at that time. It was always in our car, which had like almost 300,000 miles on that thing, right? So this, this thing would clunk all the way. Like it was, it was, it was terrible. Um, he had this iPhone that was all kinds of cracked, had a huge crack down the middle and then all these little cracks going everywhere. And it was like an iPhone one and a half. I don't even think it was a real iPhone. You know, it was like one of the bootleg ones he got off the side of the street. Like it, it was, it was a terrible phone. Uh, but when he would have it plugged into the power source in the car, it worked pretty good. He could call people. He could text people. He could get on Instagram and scroll too much. He could buy too many books. No, he was broke, broke. He couldn't buy nothing, but he would try to buy books on Amazon. Ultimately, when it was plugged into the power source, he had unlimited freedom to use it how it was created uh, to be used. Yet the second he pulled it off that power source, we'd hop out of the car and about 10 minutes later, I'd hear, ugh. And I knew what that meant. That thing had died on him. It had locked up. He couldn't use it. It was trapped. He couldn't use it for anything anymore. And spiritually speaking, this is the same for us. It's the same for you and I, that as long as we remain plugged in connected to Jesus. We have unlimited freedom in order to do what he's called us to do. Yet the second we think we've done it on our own, or we say, man, I know church was good for that season, but I think I can do it on my own. Or I know we read the Bible in the gospel series, yet I think I'll stop now. I I, I think I'll go back to just watching Fox News or CNN all the time and get all my nourishment from there. 
I could, I could preach now, but I won't. Right, the second we try to do it in our own strength again is the second that we stop living in freedom. And we'll find ourselves in the middle of the airport in handcuffs, thinking, how did I get here? I was doing so good. I was, I was following Jesus. I, I mean, I thought things were good, but I find myself in those familiar handcuffs. Yet, if we continue to abide in Jesus, in his word, in his church, with his people, intimacy with the presence of God, that's when we can continue to live in ongoing freedom. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Freedom is found in the kingdom of God. There are no chains in God's kingdom. And therefore, when we live under the rule and reign of King Jesus in his house, then we can live in unlimited freedom. Yet the time where we try to go outside of his kingdom, outside of his rule and reign, outside of his will, is a time where we look around and we're like, man, I, I, I just feel trapped again. So here's my encouragement to us this morning. Don't try to do it yourself. The slave does not remain in his house forever, but the son remains forever. True freedom isn't found in the absence of restrictions outside of his will, yet it's found under his rule and reign. The son or daughter of God remains in the house forever. Keep abiding in Jesus. How can we live in true freedom? One, we have to acknowledge that we all need it. Two, come to Jesus. And three, keep abiding in him. Stay connected. Stay in his word, in his house. Keep trusting in his promises. That's where true freedom is. True freedom isn't found in the lack of restrictions, yet in glad submission to a really good father's good, perfect, and pleasing will. Oh, man, it's like my daughter, Evelyn. I love her so much four and a half months old now. And man, I've got these plans for her that I just want to love her. I just want to take care of her. I just want to bless her, you know, to have her schedule and stuff, get her sleeping good. She slept 12 hours the past three nights. Can you believe that? Come on, Jesus. I might run a lap in this room here. Come on, somebody. Oh man, but freedom looks like for her, it's not outside of my house because right, she wouldn't make it. True freedom looks like for Evelyn, it's not, no, dad, I'm good. I can take care of myself. I'll do it myself. True freedom looks like glad submission under the rule and reign of a good father. And I just want to tell you that God loves you and he wants to take care of you and he wants to give you freedom this morning. How can we live in true freedom? One, knowledge we need it to come to Jesus and three keep abiding in Jesus to close this morning uh, just man I think it's easy to hear a message like this and think all right pastor what do you know though you know like I know you got your earrings and your little skinny jeans and all that but like, what do you know about freedom well here's a piece of my story man so as a kid I had a really bad speech impediment uh, I couldn't talk at all. If you were to say, what's your name? I literally could not get the words out of my mouth. I hesitated and I stuttered on every single word. Had all kinds of anxiety that went along with that sweaty palms every place I went. But on top of that, I had this emptiness in, in uh, just my soul, in my heart. That I didn't really understand why it was there that I had friends and stuff that were happy and could put on the happy face, but on the inside, I just felt like, man, I'm, I just have this emptiness, this hole. And as a small kid, I made a decision of, hey, man, if I've got this speech impediment, anxiety thing, and this emptiness, then I'm gonna try to get as much pleasure from this world as possible. And I chased after all kinds of different things. It was like sports at first, except as you can see, I'm short and white and can't jump, so that didn't work so well. 
Okay, okay, okay. It's not sports, it's popularity. If I get really popular and I wear the right clothes and everyone thinks I'm cool, I'm in the in crowd, then I'll be happy and I'll be calm and stuff. And tried that for a while, that didn't work. And I tried all these different things. But eventually I smoked weed for the first time. And I thought I'd found my answer, to be honest with you. It calmed me down a little bit. The hole that was in my soul kind of closed up for just a few minutes. And I was like, man, I, this is the answer. I'll just do this. But quickly after that, and I got into harder and harder drugs, and I became a heroin addict. As a 16-year-old high school student, I was a full-blown heroin junkie. And uh, the thing that I had ran to uh, to try to find joy and pleasure eventually trapped me and enslaved me. And every day I lived for that high. I got up and I did whatever it told me to do in order to get more of it. And man, as you can imagine, you know, my life got really bad. Health issues, financial issues, a lot of legal issues. Um, and I was like, man, something's wrong. Like, I got to get out of this, right? I got to start fighting this. This is bad. So like we do in times like that, I tried everything. I tried the meetings. I tried lots of rehab centers. I got on medication. I went to counselors. I went to all types of different places trying to, trying to break myself free. And the harder I fought, the more I sank. I mean, finally, man, I hit a rock bottom. I'd lost a lot of friends and I lost my dad to a heart attack. I found him dead on the floor. And I was, uh, I was about 100 pounds, you know, so the same height as I am now, but literally half a human ago. I had track marks up and down my arms and I was out of money. I mean, really the options were homelessness or to go to yet another treatment center. And I was like, man, I don't think I'll make it too long on the streets. Um, and I ended up, I was like, man, all right, I'll go to treatment. Um, I ended up in Florence, South Carolina, at a treatment center there. And about a week later, uh, I got invited to a church service. Uh, and I wasn't raised in the church. I didn't have any real view of God or who Jesus was or anything like that. But I was invited to that church service. And I was like, all right, I'll, I'll go. And on Christmas Eve of 2010, I heard the gospel I heard that there's a real God who loves broken people. Yeah. Oh, oh man, I heard that there's a real man named Jesus who came to earth, who lived a perfect life in our place, who was crucified on that cross, who rose from the grave, conquering sin and death and shame and Satan. Yeah. And I heard that night, if I would turn from my sins and trust Christ and try to follow him, that I'd be healed and I'd be delivered and my whole life will be changed. And I'm telling y'all, from way down deep in my heart, nothing has been the same since. I prayed to receive Christ and he changed everything in my life. We can give God glory for that. Come on. And man, he is a healer. <laughs> he can heal anything in your life. So here's what I know about a uh, kind of room this size. And I sense the spirit uh, just moving in this direction. Is that, man, I know there's people here this morning who need Jesus. Like just like me that day, trying to fight, trying to get out of it myself and sinking deeper. The one thing that changed it was not my effort. It was reaching up my hands saying, hey, Jesus, I, I, I need you. And here's the thing. That same power is available to you and I this morning. Jesus has paid for your sin. All you got to do is receive it. Receive his free gift of salvation. And so what that looks like is not, all right, I'm just going to try harder. It's you turning from your old life and trusting in Jesus Christ. 
And that can happen this morning. Would you close your eyes with me? Because I wanna give you a chance to just respond to God's love this morning. If that's you, then I'm gonna lead you in a prayer. It's not the prayer that saves you. It isn't if you get all the words right, then you're a Christian. But rather, it's a heart posture of I surrender. I'm trusting in you, Jesus. As you pray this, the God of the universe is gonna hear it. You don't have to speak it out loud. You just have to pray it in your heart. He is love and he's closer than your closest thoughts. And if he's drawing you to himself right now, respond to his love and kindness. If that's you, then pray something like this in your heart. Heavenly Father, I need you to save me. I know I'm a sinner and I know I can't save myself but I'm reaching out my arms to you right now, Jesus. I believe you died on the cross. I believe you rose from the grave. I repent of my sins and I place my faith in you, Jesus. Teach me how to live for you for the rest of my life. I'm all in. With all heads down and all eyes closed, man, if you just prayed to receive Christ, would you throw your hand up in the air for me in order that I can see it? Come on, anybody else? Oh, man, please leave your hands up because I want to count, and it's going to take a little while. So would you put it straight up in order that I can see it real good? And I'm going to count because I love to give God glory for what he's doing. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, keep them up, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50. Y'all, can we give God some praise that 50 people just respond to the gospel? Come on, somebody. Y'all, I'm going to get out of your way so y'all can stay standing, but let's worship King Jesus in this place. Hey, everyone. Thanks for watching the Destination Church YouTube channel. But don't stop there. Hit the like, the share button, and definitely subscribe to this channel to stay up to date with everything that we want to give you. Hey, if it's impacted your life, please pray about giving financially to help people find their destination in Christ. Hey, just know it's not about where you've been. It's where you're going that matters, and the best is yet to come.